Get it? All right, I will begin. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day. I uh, think for the weekend, it's about to start. Uh, just help us to uh, use this time wisely, Lord, that we would glorify you in what we do, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so um, I'm going to use the projector today because I have a, I have a lot to say. Um, and um, I just want to kind of start back at the uh, start of last time, just to remind you what we're doing. Um, a subring um, of a, a ring R is called an ideal. If it is what? If it has this property that it's closed under right and left multiplication by elements of the ring, right? It's got this so-called uber, if we're, if we're to adopt the terminology of Dr. Sprano, uber, clo uber closure. All right, um, and we got this, uh, this very nice test to check that it's an ideal. What do you got to do? You got to show that it's um, closed under subtraction, right? That makes it a subring. And then check for um, basically uber closure. If you got those two things, it's an ideal. So that's nice to know. Now, we talked about principal ideal last time. Here's an example. I don't think I actually covered. Um, if you have the uh, ring of polynomials with integer coefficients, that's a commutative unital ring, all right? You can look at the ideal, which is generated by x and 2. Um, what would that look like? It's basically things of the form x times some polynomial plus 2 times some polynomial, right? So what is this? What, what is it? Oh, oh, okay. So what is that? Well, that's just, uh, I mean, if you sort through it, you know, multiply out the polynomial h and j like this and kind of collect terms, which you, which see what you got is you got a polynomial that has an even constant term and, well, pretty much everything else can be arbitrary, right? So this is an example of an ideal in the uh, ring of uh, polynomials with integer coefficients. So there's all kinds of interesting ideals that you can find inside the polynomial rings. Polynomial rings actually um, don't count them out. I mean, they're a big part of the story here. It's important that you, you know, try to understand them. In fact, uh, hopefully Monday we'll be really just focused in on how to construct polynomials and work with them. I've been borrowing from your high school algebra or whatever to do polynomial manipulation, but we will soon be a little bit more systematic about that. Anyway, um, another example, if you have um, the ring of uh, functions from, from the reals to the reals, right? Real value functions, real variable. Um, it's pretty easy to see that that gives you a, um, a ring by pointwise addition and multiplication, right? The sum of functions is a function, the product of functions is a function, and it satisfies the usual um, distributivity properties. Um, it's commutative because R is commutative. Anyway, you could look at the um, set of differentiable functions, right? Is the product of differentiable functions differentiable? What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah right? We have the product rule. Um, is a sum? Well, yeah, sure, right? So it's a subring, right? If you take the product or sum of differentiable functions, you again get differentiable functions, but this is not an ideal. Why? Um, for example, if you look at f of x equals to 1, we have f prime of x equals to 0, right? So this f is in, it's a differentiable function. This g, right, absolute value of x, that's your kind of quintessential non-differentiable function, right? It's got a kink in the graph at 0, you guys know this. And if you look at f of x times g of x, you get absolute value of x, and that's not differentiable, so the ring of differentiable functions is not an ideal. There's, a, there's an example of something that's a subring but not an ideal. All right. I will continue down this <clears throat> show and tell. Is it, um, let's see here. So we, uh, I presented this theorem to you last time. If we have a subring, um, which is also a ideal, <coughs> then this is how you define the quotient ring or factor ring um, of R by A, all right? These will be well-defined operations provided that A is an ideal, all right? So we're gonna use that. Here's an example, a kind of silly example of a quotient ring. Um, if I have the integers, and if I look at the ideal of three times the integers, right, th the multiples of three, 
then the coset space is 3z, 1 plus 3z, 2 plus 3z. All right. Here's your Kalei table for addition. Here's your uh, multiplication table over here. And um, this, this part of the multiplication table is kind of stupid to write, right? If you're smarter, you'll uh, just make a little two by two table here and say, well, you know what, zero times anything is zero. So yeah, that's not really surprising. On the other hand, it's kind of satisfying to write it because it's like, I don't know, you just feel like you're, you're doing something. <laughs> you know it's right. Maybe that's not a good reason to do something though. I don't know. Um, anyway, if you look at this, you can pretty clearly see that this is exactly the, the patterns for Z mod three, right? And that's because this is Z mod three, literally Z mod three. Z mod three is the factor ring of the integers by the multiples of three. That's in fact our construction, right? This is just a different notation we haven't used as much, right? Thankfully, I don't use this notation for modular arithmetic, right? If every time I wrote X, I wrote X plus NZ, it would get really old really fast, wouldn't it? Um, but these are the same thing, right? Here's the explicit connection. This one plus three Z is one three. And a lot of times we don't even write the brackets of three, right? When there's not any confusion, we just write one in context. Another example, um, we have two by two matrices with two by, uh, two, by two matrices with integer, co inter integer entries. You can look at the, um, basically the sort of even entry matrices would be what this is, right? And um, you can prove that that's a, uh, an ideal. How would you do it? Well, I'll use the ideal test. First of all, the difference of two such things is again two times a integer matrix. So it's, it's again in the, in the set A. And the product, well, and I, I should take the product of something in A with something in R, right? Be careful about that. Um, some of you are, well, I'll shut up. Um, wound's still too fresh, I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, X times Z is, well, that's X times uh, X prime, two X prime Z, because X is in, um, blah, blah, blah. I'm assuming X is in A, right? So X is equal to two X prime. So then again, X prime Z is again an integer matrix. So we have twice an integer matrix, that's again an A. So there you go, that's A. Um, an ideal, I guess I'm supposed to check, <sighs> wait a second here. I think this, is, this example is missing something, isn't it? What did we have in the ideal test? Whoa, I should have had a link. I need two things, right? I need that AR and RA are in A again, right? I've only, cla I've only checked half of the Uber closure <laughs> for, my, for my example we're just looking at. So that, that's my, my, I'll have to fix that, guys. Sorry about that. Ah, here we are. So again, I should also check that Z times X is in, is in there, but it's not hard to show it. You just pull the two out and you, it's, 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 it's almost the same thing. Um, anyway, <coughs> what's always a, pe a peskier question is how many things are in the quotient, right? How many things are in a quotient um, uh, and what do they look like? Well, that's sometimes a pain. I guess it's not too hard to figure out how many things are in there, right? Just c counting. Um, well, oh, I can't count here, can I? I'm sorry. Uh, how many things are in R? Infinity, right? <laughs> yeah. So here I, I, I don't think I can use counting directly. Anyway, these are the uh, distinct cosets. If you start thinking through it, you'll see this. You got A, you've got one, zero, zero, one plus A, right? I can't put two here because that's the same thing I already have. Right? So I just keep going. Then I put 0, 1 plus A. All right? I can't put 2 here because that's already back over here. And so then the next one is 1, 1, and then I go, and, you know, basically this is just binary counting if you know that. Um, anyway, so there are 16 things here. <clears throat> this is an example I worked a little bit on. I'm going to show you a rather different different way than, than Galeon does. Um, so here we have the Gaussian integers as a ring, right? Those are the A plus BI things, right? Where A and B are integers. And um, we're gonna look at the quotient by the principal ideal two minus I. 
Okay, so um, the, the key here is that 2 plus 2 minus i is equal to i plus 2 minus i. Why is that true? Because, well, if you take the difference of 2 and i, you get 2 minus i, so that's in there. Right, so by the definition of cosets and so forth, we have that basically for repre at the level of representatives, 2 is equal to i. So this allows us a vast simplification. Um, and uh, so I think it's best to look at this in terms of a picture. So let me show you the picture I made. Oops. Yeah. Come on. Go away, you stupid bar. How do you make that thing go away? Ah. You guys are smart. Thank you. Um, so basically here, this grid illustrates the Gaussian integers. So the dots, it's just the dots that are the Gaussian integers basically form a lattice. <coughs> Z2 cross Z2 in the complex plane. So when you take and you, and you go mod by the principal ideal generated by 2 minus i, that connects different points on this lattice as being the same point, right? Like if I can take this point 0 and I can add 2, right? over and I subtract 1 i, that gives me this point. So this and that are the same because they differ by the thing in the, the, the generator of the ideal. Right? These have the same represent, these are the same representative. I mean they represent, excuse me, they represent the same coset even though they're different representatives. So um, on the other hand, so basically what you do is I take 2 minus i, right, which is this guy, and then like minus, um, minus that is this over here, right? The other thing you can do, because an ideal is closed under multiplication, what are like the fundamental things you can do? Um, if I multiply 2 minus i by, by i, that's still in the ideal, right? So the other thing that's in this ideal besides 2 minus i is 2i minus i squared, right? Which is 1 plus 2i. So that's why I can also go this way and get the same thing because that's i times the generator of the ideal. And then this, um, to go the other way, which I haven't drawn this way, which is sort of the relation between this and that, that's, um, <coughs> sorry, I can, can't do math here, um, minus, yeah, minus, minus 1 minus 2i. That's what you would get from multiplying this by minus i, right? So if I take the representative of the ideal and, um, Oh, how to say this? Uh, well, anyway, um, you can you can check that. Um, oh, I'm having. <sighs> Long story short, when you're trying to visualize these things, what you do is just figure out um, the relation that this implies between the representatives. And so, basically, I got four options. I can either go this way, or go that way, go that way, or go that way. And um, then all these points are linked. And so if you start sorting through that, you pick another point, and then all of those will also be likewise linked because I can go over one and up two, or I can go back two and up one, or like this. You notice they form these like squares like that. And um, so this, this shaded picture has one of each representative, one of each cosets represented. There's either the green one, the red one, the yellow one, the pink one, or the blue one which happens to be the same, the same coset as on each of the uh, corners here. Um, <clears throat> so I think one of the homework problems I've assigned you is to say how many, how many elements are there in the Gaussian integers mod 3 minus i, right? So you could try to visualize that through a similar sort of picture, right? And any questions about this? I don't know if I've entirely con made a convincing argument as to why the geometry is what it is. I think I explained it up here in this paragraph a little bit. <laughs> Excuse me. What's that? Oh no. That which one? 
That one? Oh, man, I thought I got all those out. I think. I should behave. Um, so, I mean, to be more explicit here, guys, 2 minus i is an element of this thing, right? And i minus 2 is an element of this thing, right? So the sum of those two, oh, that's dumb. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's not helpful. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm just, um, if I square it, it should also be in there, right? So that's what, 4 um, minus 4i um, minus 1, which is what? 3 minus 4i. So if I take this, right, and I subtract, uh, or, or um, I don't know. There, there, uh, this is, I'll just have to leave it as a claim right now. I'm, I'm drawing a blank on how to make it a convincing argument. It's not that hard to show. i just uh, just drawing a blank at the moment. Fine. So my, my, my essential point is that 2 minus i is in there. i minus 2 is in there. That's not surprising. What I'm having trouble explaining at the moment, convincing myself, is that why that is also in in the uh, in the ideal and why this is also in the ideal all right so that's my question that i'm stuck on at the moment and i'm unwilling to uh spend too much more time on it so i'm going to go on but that's that's i think that's the thing i haven't really entirely explained is why it is that i times that and minus i times that is in the ideal as well it is and the fact that that's in it those are the smallest things that can be in the ideal all right, everything else is bigger. So those sort of give you the fundamental generators of the, the lattice here for each, for each coset. You can't have something smaller than that if you sort through it. Yeah. It just has something to do with the fact that i and minus i are units. Are I and minus, you said i and minus i are units? Yeah, that, that may be part of it. Anyway, I, I must go on. Um, but I'll just leave that as an open question here that I'll try to settle at the start of next class. So in short, um, you can see that the Gaussian integers mod the principal ideal 2 minus i. It's basically these four things, these four uh, cosets using the notation bracket 0 for the, um, well, bracket x for x plus the principal ideal generated by 2 minus i. And you can see down here on the real line well, I haven't drawn it quite, but 0, 1, 2, 3, the next thing over here is 4, right? So that, that covers all the, all the cosets, the entire quotient ring here. Now, this picture is not in Galen, so I'm just I'm adding something here. I think this is a useful way of thinking about these, this particular example, though, in my, my experience. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so another example, real polynomials. Um, and you can look at the principal ideal x squared plus 1. All right. Um, notice that if you take x squared and you add x squared, if you add and subtract 1, that gives you x squared plus 1 minus 1, right? But the x squared plus 1, we can absorb into the ideal, so we just get back to minus 1. I mean, this is another way we can think about the calculation. In short, we have that x squared is congruent to minus 1 modulo x squared plus 1, all right? Um, so like here's an example. You could do this simplification. If I have 1 plus 2x plus x to the fourth plus x squared, I can think of x to the fourth as x squared squared, right? And um, so what I really have is 2x plus minus 1 squared. Um, these, these cancel, right? And so lo and behold, this, this messy thing is actually just 1 plus 2x, all right? Now, we can be greedier. If you take any polynomial, right, you can divide by x squared plus 1, and you can find a quotient and a remainder. The remainder will have degree, which is less than x squared plus 1, right? It'll be degree 1, or it'll be 0, in which case the degree is undefined. So in short, you get this equation, right? You can factor an x squared plus 1 out times something plus this other thing. 
which is ax plus b, what happens in the quotient ring? In the quotient ring, f of x is really just congruent to r of x, right? So in short, the quotient ring r of x mod x squared plus 1, it just has the form a plus bx um, plus x squared plus 1, like that. I think I went over this last time. I'm sorry, guys. I, well, I, I wrote some things on here, but I, uh, I need to get back into it because I have a little bit more to say here about this. Um, anyway, you can really see this is the complex numbers, right? If you just multiply the coset a plus bx by the coset um, represented by c plus dx, and you multiply that out, well, x squared is congruent to minus 1, right? So you get a minus here. And that's exactly the same rule as if you, you know, multiply a plus bi by c plus di, right? It's just like x is behaving as the imaginary unit, right? Okay, so. Sorry, I'm just adding a little bit more examples to last, the last lectures. We defined last time, towards the end, a prime ideal and a maximal ideal, right? Um, I made some horrible typo here. Or yeah, I guess you, you guys decided it wasn't a typo. But um, it's up to you. A prime ideal of, of R is, is, is an ideal. Um, oh, man, did I not? Oh, no, that's right. If A and B, they're, they're in the ring, right? But if the product of A and B is an element of A, an element of the ideal, that implies either A is an element of the ideal or B is an element of the ideal. Who was that? Mr. P, I presume. It was a seesaw. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a prime ideal. Now, if you had number theory with me, we defined prime ideal in a rather different way, and we discovered this was an equivalent formulation. I think if you look at it, this is pretty nice to work with compared to the, his. Like, anyway, this is a, this is the nice one to work with. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. This this one's I think this one's easier. Um, a is a maximal ideal of the ring, um, if any ideal that's between A and the ring has to either be A or the ring, right, basically. So it's maximal. Okay, so, <clears throat> as I mentioned last time, stupid. Huh. It works when I don't want it to. Oh, well, it's okay. So I added this picture. Woo All right. This I haven't worked out yet. This I mentioned last class, but I haven't gone through with you guys. I want to go through it with you. Um, so <clears throat> if we have an ideal, um, so I want, I want to prove that x squared plus 1 is maximal. All right? Um, so suppose you have an ideal between x squared plus 1 and the polynomials, right? Um, such that it's not equal to a. What do we need to show then? All, we, all that's left to show is that, I mean, if it's equal to A, fine, we're done. If it's not equal to A, the thing is it has to be R. It has to be all the polynomials. Otherwise, a would, otherwise <coughs> x squared plus 1 would not be maximal. Okay, so um, <coughs> you pick, pick f of x in, in A, all right, um, which is not in the ideal generated by x squared plus 1. What's that mean? That means that um, if you look at f of x and you run the division algorithm on it, you get a remainder which is not zero, right? The remainder has to be non-zero because if it were zero, that would just say that f of x is in the ideal we're saying it's not in, right? I mean, if, f of, if r of x is zero, that means f of x is in the ideal generated by x squared plus one. So the remainder must be non-zero. And the remainder has the form ax plus b. So what we got then is ax plus b is equal to f of x minus q of x times x squared plus one. But notice that f of x is in A, and q of x times x squared plus 1, well, that's in the ideal generated by x squared plus 1, but we're assuming that that's a subset of A, right? So that means that both this term and that term are in A, consequently, their, sum, their difference is in A. Okay. And um, also, if you look at ax squared minus A squared x squared minus b squared, well, that's ax plus b times ax minus b, um, and um, so then what? That says that the product, pr produce, 
<laughs> Since the product of AX plus B um, and AX minus B. So I already have that AX plus B is in the ideal, right? And so th this is just a polynomial in the reals. And consequently, this thing is in A again because it's just the product of a polynomial times something, the product of a polynomial times something in the ideal, right? So that means that this is in the ideal A, but then what? Um, we also have that a squared times x squared plus 1 is in the ideal, so check it out. a squared plus b squared, which is non-zero by assumption y. a and b are the coefficients in the remainder. Remember that's non-zero. So a squared plus b squared, not zero, but that's also equal to this. This is a very sneaky argument. Look at this. They canceled to get a squared plus b squared. What's this show? This shows there's a non-zero real number inside a. Once you have that, you can easily prove that A is the whole, the whole kit and caboodle. It's the whole, um, because here, notice that 1 is equal to 1 over A squared plus B squared times A squared plus B squared, right? This is an element of A because that's an element of A, right? And so 1 is inside A, but you notice that the principal ideal generated by 1 is what? 1 is equal to 1 times f of x, such that f of x is in r of x. What is that? That's just everything, right? Once you find, if you have a ring with unity, right? If you have 1 in the ideal that you're looking at, that means that the ideal is the whole ring. This is the driving force between several important proofs, all right? Um, so. Anyway, so there you go. That means that if you have a, an ideal which is larger than x squared plus 1, it has to be the whole, the whole polynomial ring, and that shows that the ideal x squared plus 1 is maximal. All right? That's a, I, I think that this argument here is rather clever. This is much more clever than most of the things I show you. There's something genuinely sneaky about this argument I just showed you. Um, I'll skip past that. We still have more to do. Last time I proved this one, right? I proved that it's worth saying again. If you have a commutative ring with unity, and if A is an ideal of R, the quotient ring R mod A is an integral domain if and only if A is prime, right? So this we proved at the end of last class. We'll use it again this class, though. Here's the next thing we were going to prove. Um, <clears throat> let R be a commutative ring with unity, A an ideal of R. The quotient ring, R mod A, is a field if and only if A is maximal. All right, let's walk through it. So, <coughs> so if and only if proof, so we have the both directions, right? Um, suppose, so to start with, I assume that we have a commutative ring with unity, an ideal, A is an ideal of R. That's for both, both directions, all right? That's just the, the preconditions here. Now, next here, I am assuming that R mod A is a field. All right, what's my goal? I want to show it's maximal, right? So, notice that 1 plus A serves as the unity. Why is that? I guess I, I think I wrote it. Here's the details down here for that, if you don't believe it. 1 plus A times R plus A is equal to 1 R plus A, which is equal to R A. So you see that the unity plus A serves as the unity for the quotient, right? Okay, um, I probably should have that as like a lemma earlier in the notes or something, sorry. Um, time travel, not available to me. I'm not a poorly produced NBC, um, soon to be canceled show. Oh, uh, who am I kidding? Timeless is gonna live on for years on NBC. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, why are they traveling around in a CBS logo though? That's what I wanna know. So, I'm sorry, you guys don't watch TV. I'm making irrelevant comments. Um, good for you, good for you. Let's see here. Um, so. Oh, it's on the Netflix? I said if it's not on Netflix, they don't see it. Ah, yes. My parents have just discovered uh, Blacklist because they've got Netflix and it's all they're watching. So <laughs> It's kind of weird. Like I was calling Dad up to see what his feeling was about the World Series because it's about the only baseball game I'll watch in a year. And uh, the last one, the last game, typically. So like the Cubs 
the Cubs had almost seemed they had their uh, it sealed the deal, and then I called them up and they're like, uh, "You watching the World Series?" Like, "No, we don't have TV. We're watching we're watching Blacklist on Netflix." I'm like, "I mean, was it Blacklist? Yeah, Blacklist." I'm like, what? It's just bizarre. Anyway, I digress. Okay, so if this is a field that has a unity, right? What is a field? It's an integral domain where everything, well, that's not the right way to say it. A field is a commutative ring with identity in which every non-zero element is a unit, right? It has a multiplicative inverse. Um, okay, so the, um, if you have y plus, so to, to say that, you know, to say that x plus a has an inverse is to suppose that this equation has a solution, right? x plus a times y plus a equals to 1 plus a, there has to be some y plus a that makes this go, right? In other words, there has to be, so that, that, that's the same as xy plus a equals to 1 plus a, right? And that is tantamount to saying that 1 minus xy is an element of a, right? So um, x is an element of b implies that xy is an element of b, <coughs> as b is an ideal, all right? Um, Remember, we're considering this b, which is between a and r possibly, with a not equal to b. Our goal is to do what? Our goal is to show that this b has to be r. Showing that will prove maximality. So, <coughs> yeah, eventually I'll stop coughing. Not today, though. Anyway, since a is a subset of b, that means that 1 minus xy is in b, right? But xy is also in b, so what's that show? xy plus 1 minus xy, 1. One's in B. What did we just get done doing? Right, just the last example I was showing you is so important because it's like one of the first, I mean, that, that idea that once you have one in an ideal, it's the whole ring. So important to know. And so there it is. Once I have one is in B, that proves that B is in fact the whole ring since one, uh, uh, since the principal ideal generated by one. Um, <coughs> anyway, this, this little argument shows that X, um, is in B for any X and R, which is to say that B is equal to R. <laughs> so anyway, A is a maximal ideal. All right, so then the other direction. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me go over here. Maybe that'll help. Suppose A is a maximal ideal. All right. And then we construct this, this ideal B. B is equal to um, XR plus A. All right, first of all, I pick a non-zero element in here. What, what's my goal that this show? Is my, my goal is to show that um, R mod A is a field, right? So what do I have to do? I'm already ah, assuming it's a commutative ring with unity. So what I gotta do, mostly, is to show that there's a multiplicative inverse to this element. All right, so towards that goal, we construct B equals XR plus A. Um, I leave it to the reader to verify that B is an ideal of R. That's not a hard thing to show, but you can show that B is an ideal. Um, and so, check this out. If A is an A, then A is equal to X times zero plus A, right? So that means A is in B. See that? Not that hard. What's that mean? Any element of A is a subset of B. Any element of A is in B, that means that A is a subset of B, right? But we're assuming what? We're assuming that B, we're assuming that, there are, Assuming A is maximal, right? So if B is an ideal which contains A, right, that means that B has to be equal to R, right? Um, therefore, one is an element of B, which means that there exists an R such that X times R plus A is equal to one, which says what? That one minus XR is an element of A. So what does that give us? So anyway, my point is that this, um, this x, see I have a multiplicative inverse for the x plus a like I set out to find, all right? And then what's left to do is to prove that, um, you know, prove that x, x um, to prove that r mod a has the other properties of a field, right? What, am I, what do I still need? I need, um, you know, a unity. So here's the proof that one plus a is the unity and I need that um, it's a commutative ring, right? So here's the proof of, if you have commutativity of the, um, of the ring, you get commutativity of the quotient, right? 
And so you go, we have a commutative ring with unity where every non-zero element has a multiplicative, in multiplicative inverse. In other words, R mod A is a field. Oh, this proof is not that hard, but it's very hard to say. Oh. This example is mostly important because we undo it with a simpler argument at the end of this lecture, okay? So let's suffer through it briefly. Um, since a field is an integral domain, it follows a maximal ideal must be a prime ideal in view of these theorems, all right? What does that mean? Since a field is an integral domain, right? So if you have R mod A is a field, right? That means that R mod A is also an integral domain. So that implies that a maximal ideal must also be a prime ideal. Because we have this theorem, if R mod A is an integral domain, that's true if and only if what? If, if A is a prime ideal. So maximal implies prime, but the other direction isn't so. Um, so here's an example of an ideal which is prime but not maximal. Um, if you look at X and ZX, you can prove that it's prime by this little argument. Um, to show it's not maximal, you can look at the, uh, the ideal generated by x and 2. And um, 2 is an element of x and 2, but 2 is not an element of the ideal generated by x. So that shows you that there's something in here that's not in there, which means that the ideal generated by 2 and x is, is bigger than the ideal generated by x. And it's also not everything because there's, there's lots of there's lots of things in the polynomials generated by, by X which are not of this form. <clears throat> All right. So that brings us to lecture 24 finally here. <laughs> um, there's actually not much in here. It's really deja vu all over again. Um, so first of all, what's a ring homomorphism? It is a function from one ring to another such that what? You preserve addition and you preserve multiplication. What's a ring isomorphism? It's a bijective homomorphism, right? Yeah. So um, our notation will be two rings are isomorphic. We write R uh, isomorphic to S like that. Um, because you guys won't let me have nice things, we have no notation for homomorphic rings. Um, that's all on you guys. I, I was going to fix it, but you won't let me, so oh well. Um, we, don't, we, don't also have, we also have no notation for subring at the moment, that's true. You have to use words, sorry. Um, let's see here. Um, a good ring homomorphism, how about just this? The uh, mapping from the integers to Zn, the coset map, this is a ring homomorphism, right? And um, this is called the natural homomorphism, right? Um, it's also called the coset map because in another notation, really just have phi of x is equal to x plus nz. It's the coset map, right? Another good example of a ring homomorphism is actually an automorphism, um, is complex conjugation, right? The complex numbers form a, um, a field, right? Which is a specific kind of ring, right? And um, Complex conjugation has these properties. The complex conjugate of a product is the product of the complex conjugates. The complex conjugate of a sum is the sum of the complex conjugates. These, are th these things are true. Perhaps you proved them in your complex variables course. They're not hard to prove. I mean, this would be a welcome respite from most of the stuff we did today. It's easy peasy. Anyway, so long story short, that means that this mapping is a ring isomorphism because this is in fact invertible, right? In fact, it's its own inverse, isn't it? Because if you take the conjugate to the conjugate, you get back where you started. So in fact, um, not to, and again, sorry if this is rubbing um, salt in a very fresh wound, but this is in fact an automorphism of order two. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, another another uh, example, and this is kind of an uber example, the evaluation map. Um, if you take polynomials with coefficients in a ring, you pick any point you like in the ring. You define this map. If you feed it the polynomial, it just says stick the number into the polynomial, and that's going to be the definition of the map. So that 
um, defines a, a homomorphism because if you look at the sum of two functions, then by the pointwise addition, you get the, see there's the additive property for the homomorphism. Here's the multiplicative property for the homomorphism. It's just pretty straightforward function stuff. And so there you go. That's a, we always have this ring homomorphism from polynomials over a ring to the ring itself. This is a very handy homomorphism. We do a lot with this in future chapters. It seems like a really simple thing, but um, it's actually pretty important. Here's a bunch of stuff we already know. <laughs> sort of already know. I mean, we know it for groups. But now, let us agree, it should be known for rings. We can pull out, um, so this is basically the power, um, what's the word? This is the exponent law additively. Here's the exponent law multiplicatively. We got both for a ring. You notice there's no inverse law because generally speaking, our inverse doesn't have to exist in the ring, right? Um, the image of an ideal, let's see here, A is an ideal, excuse me, A is a subring, B is an ideal. Be careful. Um, so this is the image of a subring is a subring. Um, if you have an ideal, then um, the image of an ideal is an ideal. All right. The inverse image of an ideal is an ideal. If R is commutative, a homomorphic image of R is also commutative. Um, now this one, we found an example which violated six, right? Check this out. If R is unity and S is not equal to the zero ring, that stupid ring, and here's the key, phi is a surjection, then phi of one is the unity of S. In some sense, that example I showed you where we got different unities in the subring, that, well, I guess that's just a different thing, but in some sense, it's, there's some lack of surjectivity there if you look at it from the right way, I think. I should go back and look at that and try to explain the example where we, where we found a different unity in the subring and see if I can connect that concept to this one. That's something I'm just thinking about now. Um, anyway, so seven. Uh, phi is an isomorphism if and only if phi is surjective and the kernel is zero. Here the kernel is the additive kernel, all right? And there, the structure of the kernel is exactly the one we proved before because remember a ring is first an additive group, right? So everything we know for groups, for additive groups, is true for rings with respect to the additive structure, be careful. Um, finally, if you have a ring isomorphism, then the inverse image is also, the inverse function actually is also an isomorphism. This theorem we found in linear algebra even where we said that if we have a bijection which is linear, the inverse is automatically linear. That's this theorem again. <coughs> um, Galen doesn't have proofs of much of these. He basically just says, hey, it's the same proof as before. I thought it would be good to at least give one proof here, so I did that, all right? Um, it's a pretty important one um, because this is the, well, this was on our test, right? Let phi be a ring homomorphism from a ring R to a ring S. Then the kernel of phi, which is the additive kernel, is an ideal of R. All right, so what I'll do is I'll use the ideal, the ideal subring test here. First of all, if you take A and B in the kernel, that means that they both map to zero. So if I take the image of their difference, I get the difference of their images, which is zero minus zero, which is zero. Woohoo. So that means that A minus B is in the kernel. Uh, on the flip side, oh look, I figured out you need both sides for the, the, sub, the, the ideal test now. Good job. Um, let's see here, so the homomorphism property of rings, right? Phi of R times A is phi of R times phi of A. But hey, A is in the kernel, so that's zero. And we um, proved, or I mentioned the proof of last time, that anything times zero gives you back zero in a ring, right? That's a derived consequence of the ring identity, of the ring axioms. And likewise, zero multiplied on the other side gives you zero. So in short, we have uber closure, and that shows that the kernel is actually an ideal. Okay. So I, I wanted to give a standalone proof. I resisted the urge to say stuff like, we already know the kernel of phi is a normal subgroup in the additive sense. I mean, I could say that, but I just thought it would be healthy to see a standalone proof here, so I did that. Oh, don't worry. I, I, I say exercise for the reader, but that's, that's, a, that's a future exercise for the reader. That's not actually one that happened. 
on this lecture, all right? I picked out Galean problems for you. Um, <clears throat> but we also have first isomorphism theorem for rings, exactly the same in spirit, right? Phi from R to S, a ring, ring homomorphism, the mapping from R mod the kernel to the image of R given by the, in the usual way is a ring isomorphism, right? You're mapping using the um, R plus the kernel maps to phi of R. So we have this first isomorphism theorem. We also have that, this theorem I have I've, I've emphasized less, but in fact every, every ideal of a ring is the kernel of some ring homomorphism of R. This is a very kind of stupid theorem. I don't know. I mean, okay, fine. I even wrote a proof for it, but I'll let you read it. I don't think it's that exciting. I'm going to go on. I don't, I don't know. It's kind of like one of those, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I'm, just not, I'm not that excited about it. Um, here's another one that I'm not that excited about. Um, if R is a ring with unity, I should be more excited about this one though. If R is a ring with unity, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm burying the lead. This one was important. Consider this, this example is really cool. Check this out. So remember that thing we looked at just about 10 minutes ago where we had to sort through all these pesky details? Watch how those details wash away when you use the first isomorphism theorem for rings and the two major theorems we have for prime and maximal ideals. Check it out. So here's a homomorphism from the polynomials with integer coefficients to the integers defined by the evaluation at zero. Right? This is evaluation at zero map. That's what that is. So, um, in fact, this is a homomorphism. I don't prove that here, but you can prove that without a lot of work. Um, and it's a surjective ring homomorphism, in fact. The kernel of phi is what? It's the ideal generated by x. That's not too hard to see, right? If phi of 0 is equal to 0 by the factor theorem of high school algebra, that means you can factor an x out. And that means that it's x times some other polynomial, which is to say that that polynomial is in the ideal generated by x. So it's really just factor theorem, this claim. So by the first isomorphism theorem, the polynomials with integer coefficients mod the principal ideal generated by x is isomorphic to z. So z is an integral domain, right? That means that the ideal generated by x is prime. But z is not a field, therefore the ideal generated by x is not maximal. That is a much easier argument than producing this x and 2 that's between x and, and all of the polynomials, right? I mean, you should understand both ways of doing this, this claim that x is, is prime but not maximal, right? The direct proof. But this, this proof using the theorems is also very nice. <coughs> okay, so um, the next theorem, if we have a ring with unity, then the mapping from the, from the integers to the rings defined by phi of n is n times 1. So basically the mapping is, give me n, and then I'm going to take the 1 in the ring, and I'm just going to add it. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, n times. That's the map. That's what this notation means, right? Remember we talked about this? Um, so I, the, the proof is not, as, not that exciting. It's page 274 to 275 of Galen. It's really kind of pesky, um, pesky details, which I probably should go over. But it boils down to this. If we have m plus n times 1, it's m, plus, m times 1 plus n plus 1. And, and, and this is also true. So these, these identities sort, uh, sort out to be true for, for this um, repeated addition notation. Um, and so anyway, that, that gives us a homomorphism um, from the integers to the ring. And this has su surprising implications. First of all, one of its implications, the first corollary, is that if you have a ring with unity and the characteristic is, is positive, that means that it has a subring which is isomorphic to Zn. And on the other hand, if the characteristic is zero, that means R has a ring inside it which is isomorphic to the integers. Very, very beautiful general statements. The next corollary says that for any positive integer m, the mapping um, from z to zm defined by this is a home ring homomorphism. I'm actually very unexcited about that corollary. I'm embarrassed that I just read it to you. Let's go on. Um, 
corollary 3.3.13, Steinitz? I don't know. Steinitz? Okay. Uh, 1910. If f is a field of characteristic p, then f contains a subfield which is isomorphic to z mod p. If f is a field of characteristic 0, then f contains a subfield isomorphic to the rational numbers. Now this is something, right? This says that given totally generic fields of various characteristics, and, and elsewhere we have proved that the characteristic is either 0 or prime. To say otherwise creates contradiction. So this is all possible fields that we're talking about. It's either characteristic 0 or it's prime. And this is saying that if you've got a field of characteristic p, it's got a copy of zp inside it in some sense. If you've got a field of characteristic 0, there's a rational, copy of the rational number, number sitting in there. That is pretty cool. Pretty cool result. Finally, um, let D be an integral domain. Then there exists a field that contains a subring isomorphic to D. This I'm going to go over next time in detail. All right. What we're going to do is we're going to show that if you give me an integral domain, all right, Integral domain is what? A commutative ring with identity where there are no zero divisors. Or wait a minute, does there have to be an identity? I forgot. There has to be an identity. Okay, so the commutative ring, no zero divisors. Right? But in an, an integral domain, you have elements which might not have inverses, like two, right? Two in the integers has no inverse. What's the inverse? It's one half, right? So this construction we're going to go over, we're going to show that you can take any integral domain and you can create a field from it where it appears as an isomorphic, like it's in there in some isomorphic sense. So basically this is like how you would create the rational numbers from the integers. Or more generally, how would you take any integral domain and create a field over it which, which has that, that integral domain inside it. I think this is one of the most interesting and beautiful constructions we'll go over next, this whole semester. So we'll do that next time. But anyway, thanks guys. Oh, there's homework here. I will post it shortly. Oh man, examples. Eh, it's okay. The show must go on. There's your homeworks. I will post this shortly. Thanks, sir.